I'm Elliot Kola from the Department of Arabic and Islamic Studies, and I'd uh, like to welcome you all to panel six of the symposium entitled Cultural and Intellectual Expressions. Um, it's a real pleasure today to introduce our panel, and I will go one by one as they present. Um, our first speaker today is Professor Cristina Sivantos. She is an associate professor in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at the, at the University of Miami. She received her PhD from one of the most, if not the leading, one of the top, if not the, the top PhD program in comparative literature at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, finishing very quickly in 1999. She works in a number of fields, including 19th and 20th century Spanish American and Arabic literary and cultural studies. Uh, she has received uh, numerous grants and awards, including a, an NEH faculty res research uh, award. And her publications include Between Arabs and uh, Between Argentines and Arabs, Argentine Orientalism, Arab Immigrants, and the Writing of Identity from SUNY Press in 2006. She has also authored many articles on Latin, Ameri Latin American and Arabic literature. Um, her talk today is entitled Strangers at Home, Intertextuality and Diaspora in Elias Khouri's Mejma al Asrar. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you to the conference organizers for this wonderful opportunity, and to all of you for sitting inside on this beautiful afternoon. Um, this project is basically centered on analysis of nostalgia and storytelling in a contemporary Lebanese novel. And since there was an earlier um, paper that made reference to a different Elias Khoury, I thought I would make sure that you know this is a different person altogether, <laughs> born in 1948 in Lebanon. Um, right. Elias, uh, Elias Khoury's Majma al-Asrar is part of a corpus of works within Arabic literature that were written in the Arab world rather than in a migrant locale that depict the impact that emigration has on the home country. In this sense, Khoury's novel is part of a more broadly defined Arab diaspora literature. It represents the view from the other side or the inside. By way of the term diaspora, vastly different experiences are sometimes lumped together under one ethnic, racial, or national rubric. And at the same time, diaspora as a concept considers the relationship of people to a location and a community. I use the term diaspora to designate perceived connections between a community and a distant place, a community that is often constructed on the basis of this perception. For these reasons, the usefulness of the term, which has been very much debated, um, I find lies in its ability to lead us to an interrogation of the ideas that we take for granted regarding community and identity. This, in turn, can lead us to see identity not as a singular belonging, but rather as connections that are multiple and dynamic. In Majma al-Asrar, these connections grow out of the relationship between two cousins. But only the younger of the two, Ibrahim Nassar, was created by the renowned Lebanese author. The other cousin, older by about 10 years, is Santiago Nassar who was given textual life by the Nobel Prize winning Colombian author, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Let's see. Uh -huh. There you have him. Um, and he was also mentioned in an earlier paper on the Arabs and Muslims in Colombia, uh, in this particular novel. Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's novella, Crónica de una Muerte Anunciada, is the pretext that presents the older cousin's tragic end and opens the door to questions about the Nassar family. The two cousins are brought together by two texts. One of these is a published readable text, Hodi's novel, in which the narrator compares the destiny of the two cousins, each a stranger in his own way. The other text, which exists within Majma al-Asra's fictional world, is a mysterious letter that makes the destiny of one cousin affect that of the other. This 1994 novel, Majma al-Asra, the collection or box of secrets, contains intertextual references to various texts, foremost among them Garcia Marquez's 1981 novella, which was published in English as Chronicle of a Death Foretold. Based on an actual event, Garcia Marquez's Crónica centers on an honor killing that is announced beforehand in many ways, 
but nonetheless comes to pass with the violent murder of Santiago Nassar, who's a member of the Levantine Arab immigrant community in a Colombian town. Majma al Asrar comments upon Garcia Marquez's novel by invoking, reworking, and expanding it in a novel about Lebanese characters in Lebanon. Khoury's text, by taking up some of the characters, themes, and narrative structures found in Marquez's text, constitutes a riff on the Colombian novel and a response to it. The Lebanese text clearly demonstrates admiration for Garcia Marquez's work, yet at the same time, it subtly criticizes Garcia Marquez's treatment of difference. Directly responding to Cronica, Khoury's text asserts that if there were any physical feature that marked Santiago Nassar as Arab, it would only be interpreted as such by non-Arabs, and then goes on to re uh, reject that such a feature exists. And this has to do with a description of Santiago in uh, Garcia Marquez's novel. In terms of narrative structure, Khoury's text pays homage to that of Garcia Marquez. Although in Majma al Asrar the narrator is uninvolved and unnamed, the structure of the text is reminiscent of that of Cronica. A narrator investigates a knot of mysterious relationships and crimes through various temporal jumps and changes in focalization. Khoury's novel, however, focuses on a group of three Lebanese Christians in Beirut. Ibrahim Nassar, a grocery store owner haunted by a family history of emigration, his best friend, Hannah, and Norma, the woman with whom they are both sexually involved. Ibrahim's life is marked by an event that took place when he was 10 years old, the murder of his cousin, Santiago, in Colombia. And this event causes Ibrahim's father, Yaqub, to call off their own plans to emigrate. So they have their bags packed and are about to leave when this letter arrives, and they call off the plans to emigrate. Ibrahim's friend, Hannah Salman, is accused of heinous crimes and tortured by the police in an effort to obtain his confession. Both Ibrahim and Hannah are involved with Norma, who is a contradictory mix of submission to men and of assertion of her independent choices. The story of the three main characters and their love triangle primarily spans from the 1940s to 1976, that is, the beginning of the Lebanese Civil War. But the narrator also takes us further back into Lebanese history. Fayyad Habi, in his study of otherness in Lebanese literature about the Civil War, refers to the novel as, quote, this box that is heavy with secrets, with the secrets of war, that Elias Khoury tries to explore through history, end quote. Habi astutely asserts that the novel, by hearkening back to 19th century Lebanese history in the way that it does, seeks to confirm that the roots of the Civil War lie not only in, immediate pa in the immediate past and external forces, but rather in Lebanon's history. I propose that this threading together of different moments in Lebanese history, including family genealogies farther back than the 19th century and turn of the century emigration to the Americas, also enables Majma al Asrar to utilize metafiction to undo meta narratives. That is, the novel focuses on the act of storytelling in order to, destabilizing, totalizing, to destabilize totalizing cultural narratives and particularly narratives about origins and belonging. Khoury's text questions how and where one is different, a stranger, and thus unsettles the nostalgic conception of loss that is a central underpinning of Arab cultural tropes, among them al-hanin lil-watan, or longing for homeland, of the emigre experience. Majma al-Asrar is composed of 15 short, untitled, and unnumbered chapters, and almost all of these segments begin with the self-referential phrase, Badat al-Hikaya Hakada. The story began like this. The critic al beridi notes that these short chapters that each start by announcing the beginning of the story create, quote, a story with multiple entry points, end quote. Like Kronika, Khoury's novel presents the relationship of the three main characters and the mysteries to which each one is linked through multiple entry points and perspectives. The effect is not to attempt to produce a more accurate or complete portrayal of the event, but rather to call into question the very idea that there can be a correct, comprehensive account. Through its structure and its incorporated metafictional opening phrase, as well as various other references to storytelling, the novel highlights the hazy border between story and reality, and the way that words shape both. A central example of the status of storytelling in the novel is Ibrahim's relationship to the family stories that his father Yaqub passed down to him. 
Yaqub told his son about the massacre of Christians in 1860 that affected their forebears in the family village. But the narrator raises questions about what exactly happened and the truth value of the oral narratives about the events. Like the narrator and Santiago, who has heard his father's versions of the same stories, Ibrahim also doubts these tales. He is inclined to believe that these stories and those about buried family treasure are only legends. Similarly, he has vague, doubt-filled recollections of the arrival of a letter announcing his cousin's death in Colombia. The letter made a particularly strong impression on the family and neighbors in Beirut because Santiago is the Spanish form of Yaqub, and the names are used interchangeably by the characters in the novel. The letter put an end to Ibrahim's father's plans to move the family to Colombia because it was interpreted by them uh, as a warning that they too might be murdered there, that they, they took it to mean that there was a lot of anti-Arab sentiment in Colombia. As an adult, Ibrahim dreams of emigrating and decides that he must see this letter, find out the truth before leaving. His interest in the letter leads him to his father's box of old documents, the box of secrets. However, in the box, all he finds are documents made illegible by the passage of time. Even in the case of the letter in Spanish, it is not only the language difference, but blurred ink that makes it inaccessible. The illegible documents in the box are a metaphor for all stories about the past, the Nassar family stories as well as Lebanese stories. They are part of a multiplicity of tales, and there is no way to know with certainty to establish truths. Majma al-Asrar is made up of secrets about which conjectures are drawn, but which are never actually revealed. One of the main secrets among these, the contents of the letter from Colombia, is touched upon, though never clearly revealed. The narrator implicitly and explicitly refers the reader to Garcia Marquez's Cronica, um, and an example of an implicit or indirect uh, reference is that he uses certain of the words that are found in the Arabic title of Kronika throughout the text, al mahfi wal mu'lan, so he, he play, plays off of the, of the word alana to, um, to invoke the title. Um, he also invokes Garcia Marquez's text um, in more direct ways, um, mentioning it through its complete title, the author's name, and including passages, just wholesale quotes from the Arabic translation within the text of the novel. However, to know more, to try to access the secrets, the reader would need to be referred out, referred outside of Hudi's text to Garcia Marquez's. But there, as anyone who has read Cronica knows, the search for truth continues. Secrets and mystery abound in the Colombian text as well such that the truth, and especially any truth with a capital T, is forever deferred in a consciously crafted version of Derrida's Différence. Full meaning is for, forever referred out and deferred to another text, the illegible letter from Colombia and Garcia Marquez's novel full of unsolved mysteries. In this way, Rudi's novel points to humans' futile attempts at uncovering supposed secrets, that is, at establishing ultimate truths when there is no stable truth to be found. The main narrative of truth that Majma al-Asrar points to as a construction is meta-narratives about stable, self-evident origins. The novel's tales and the narrative's reflections upon them lead the reader to consider what it means to be a stranger. In tandem with this, the novel addresses conceptions of home and origins. It tells us that migration, conflict, and alienation were already there. You were already a stranger before you left home. By addressing both the idealized home constructed by those who left and the idealization of life abroad created by those who stay, Majma al-Asrar suggests a multiple and dynamic conception of home and identity. The novel points to the monetary as well as emotional impact of those who left upon those who stayed. Moreover, it points to the enduring desire to leave one that persists in the present of the characters in the novel, but started long before in the furthest reaches of their family history. Ibrahim, like his father before him and his friend Hannah's son after him, is obsessed with the desire to emigrate. But his fears stop him from leaving Lebanon. On the one hand, he fears a death like that of his cousin Santiago, and on the other hand, he fears leaving his, the, the familiar, his family, his friends, the neighborhood in Beirut. 
Immigration remember, remains, however, as this dream that gives him life and lets him carry on. His dreams of emigration are linked to the concept of the stranger and his status as one. Throughout the text, Khoury takes advantage of the intersection of meanings in the words from the Arabic root gharaba. And just to give you a sense of, these are the words that recur throughout um, the novel that play off of the idea of estrangement, alienation, being a stranger. Although Ibrahim is not a foreigner in Beirut, in many ways he feels like one. He is lonely and alienated, and in that sense he is a stranger. The novel not only discusses Ibrahim as a stranger, but also points to how the other main characters are strangers, each in their own way. Hannah is alienated from those around him as a result of his experiences in jail and the Civil War. And Norma, upon Ibrahim's death, no longer has a connection to the Nassar family, though she still yearns to be a part of Beirut, to talk and feel like a Beiruti. The narrator also develops the concept of the stranger in relation to uh, Santiago Nassar and the biblical Adam, the father of us all. With regards to Santiago, the narrator builds on what Garcia Marquez suggests in Cronica. He wonders whether Santiago was killed because he was an Arab, that is, because for his fellow townspeople he was a stranger. In these passages and elsewhere, the narrator implicitly links estrangement to immigrant bilingualism. The passage evokes the ability to speak a minority language as a marker of difference that is a basis for exclusion, and also the effect of the official dominant language on the immigrant community language. Alternately, the narrator wonders if Santiago's estrangement arises from the surreal realization that death is near. Um, this confusion between reality, remembered stories, and dreams at the moment of death produce, produces this other form of alienation. Elsewhere, the narrator explicitly ties these forms of, of estrangement to migration itself, as well as a general feeling of longing. From there, the narrator takes us to the figure of Adam and his loss of paradise, as well as the primordial pre babelian language. He explains that Adam was the first stranger. Um, and this message also, the, the message of, of what is a stranger, then appears in a conversation between Ibrahim and Hannah where um, you can see the full quote here, but basically Ibrahim tries to explain to Hannah why he was looking into his father's, father's box of secrets to try and find out about his family. And Hannah's response is, we are all strangers. Here or there, what's the difference? Humans are always strangers. These statements take the reader to the psychoanalytic conception of estrangement found in Julia Kristeva's Strangers to Ourselves, in which difference is already present in the self. The Lacanian split subject stands in opposition to the Freudian ego-based conception of self in which the subject achieves a sense of coherent stability and mastery over the self. On the communal level, idealized conceptualizations of home and homeland are analogous to the illusion of the coherent, stable, true self. As Avtar Bra states in her work on the South Asian diaspora, Home is a mythic place of desire in the diasporic imagination. The idealized home is a stable origin that never quite existed as such. And Bra points out that the question of home is central to the definition of who belongs and who doesn't, to the regulation of, of social belonging. To be a stranger, then, is to not belong, to not feel at home. But the fact that this can occur without ever leaving the place called home indicates that home as such exists more as a desire than as a reality. To make this message clear and take it into the realm of homeland or community identity, Khoury's novel goes back further than the 19th century to the supposed origins of the Nassar family and of many Lebanese families. In addition to the story of the branches of the Nassar family that went to Colombia, the family's history contains migration stories that took place centuries back and include conflict and uncertainty. Their family history is actually a long series of migrations that includes a name change and religious conversions. Thus, migration and shifts in identity, movement and change, are itself the origin. There is difference at home. The narrator closes this set of stories by asking, quote, or is it that the story of the Nassar family isn't true and the Al-Ghassani lineage, which they claim, is nothing other than a small legend that entered this country whose name is Lebanon and is full of legends." End quote. 
In this way, the narrator suggests that other Lebanese families have similar histories of change and reminds the reader of the role of narrative in the creation of identity and other truths. Through these stories and meditations on family origins and the words that create them, Khoury points to the fact that movement and change are not a new phenomenon and thus reconfigures definitions of home and identity. This new conceptualization of home and identity is one that, criti that is critically aware of nostalgia as a desire for stable, self-evident origins. Just as the novel's commentary on nostalgia or longing for the past is applied to diasporic homeland and Lebanese genealogies, it can be applied to the loss of pre-Civil War Beirut, as well as the broader motif of loss in Arab cultural history, whether the poet's loss of the beloved and her desert encampment, or the loss of Al-Andalus, or the loss of Palestine. Indeed, in Majma' al-Asrar, during the narrator's meditation on Adam, the narrator invokes the mourning over the atlal, the remains of the desert encampment that is the archetypal image of the nasib, or opening section in classical Arabic poetry. The narrator states that not only was Adam the first stranger, but trumping the famous Imr al-Qais, Adam was actually the first Arab poet. And this is the, the full passage, which of course ends with those two very famous lines of poetry. By invoking this quintessential canonical expression of nostalgia for a lost love within a narrative of estranged mobile origins, Khoury critiques the nostalgia of many Arab discourses. He carries out a critical, though compassionate, commentary on nostalgic discourses that result in perpetual mourning for something that was never quite what the stories say it was. In Majma al-Asrar, Khoury's narrator tries to find meaning in to decode the Colombian novella Crónica de una muerte anunciada. This novella raises questions in Khoury about not only Santiago Nazar and other characters, but also the storytelling and cultural meta-narratives. The Lebanese text responds to these questions by telling a story by way of multiple stories, which themselves are full of questions. Mary Orr, in her study on intertextuality, notes that Kristeva com compares intertextuality to translation in an effort to move away from some of the anxieties related to intertextuality, which are um, that it um, somehow undermines the author figure um, or the idea of an original uh, creative product. And she suggests that intertextuality should then be seen as permutation. Rather than understand intertextuality and translation as scattering and loss, including loss of originality of the author, loss of a transcendental pre babel language, we should see them as conditions of plethora. In Khoury's novel, the single original author and transcendental truth are displaced, but this loss is experienced precisely as plethora, as a multitude of tales to be enjoyed. In the same way, rather than see migration and diaspora as a loss of a place of belonging, we can see it as the possibility of abundant connections. Indeed, Majma al-Asrar points to the ways in which the diaspora is still connected to home. This intertextual narrative about migration creates a commentary on truth and alienation. We can become strangers without ever leaving home, and migration and change were there from the beginning. For this reason, our yearning for a stable, whole past, if indulged, is never-ending. This message has particular implications for the representation of Arab migration and diaspora, which traditionally have centered on the longing for the homeland. Khoury deconstructs the concept of origins that is at the center of immigrant nostalgia. Once the idealized home community with an innate sense of belonging is dismantled, the constructs underlining al-hanin lil-watan, or nostalgia, also come undone. Dovetailing with recent works within Arab American literature, Majma al-Asrar points out that the cornerstone of traditional Arab migration discourses is itself a story, a fiction that we can rewrite. In the process of rewriting, we bring in narratives from near and far to construct intertextual identities, identities that exist as the confluence of various, sometimes contradictory, tales. Thank you.